Tonight on Profile, Mary Lou Stanton. I'm John Dowson, the host of uh, Profiles, and welcome once again. This week on Profiles, we're going to be talking with uh, Mary Lou Stanton, and Mary Lou is a piano teacher and a pianist, and she's been here since 1962. So a lot of you out there will probably uh, recognize her and remember her. So don't go away, we'll be right back with Mary Lou Stanton. Classroom, commercial free educational television programming provided to schools as a public service by Canadian cable companies. Cable in the classroom tears down walls, opens minds. Oh, welcome back again. Uh, Mary Lou uh, Stanton, you have been a uh, welcome to the show, by the Thank way. You. <laughs> we've, uh, we've known each other for some time and we've been on uh, certain uh, events, uh, theatrical mm -hmm. events in town and so on. But uh, you're a piano teacher and a pianist. Mm -hmm. And you've been teaching in Newmarket since 1962. I have, I have. And, and you're also the president of uh, uh, Arts Newmarket? Visual and Performing Arts Newmarket. Mm -hmm. Visual and Performing Arts, mm -hmm. oh, VPAN. Mm -hmm. So we've had you on before talking about some yeah. of the, the concerts mm -hmm. that you've had and so yeah. on. Yeah. But a, a lot of people know you and they see you around and they, they hear about you, but you know, we're, are you from Newmarket originally? No, I'm not. I grew up in Ottawa and studied piano there and did my ARCT solo performer and uh, teacher's degree when I was still in high school. Then I went to Toronto and played for ballet companies for a year. And then I moved to Stratford with my husband when we married in 1956. He was a high school history teacher, uh, taught in Stratford a little bit. And when we moved to Newmarket, I had two young children and I taught a bit then. But uh, once they got into school, I've taught quite a bit and been involved with the music festival. So if my face looks familiar, you've probably seen me at the music festival. <laughs> oh, is that the one that the Lions? Uh, yes, yes. That's and it was right. quite a small festival when I first came here. And Mae Patterson was the, the longest, uh, the, the piano teacher who had been here the longest and was an exceptionally fine teacher. And she got me involved in both the music festival and the Registered Music Teachers Association and used to take me to meetings. And I thought very highly of her. And, and I worked as the piano, uh, chairperson with the festival for I think about 20 years. Well was it um, going when you arrived? It was and it was it was, uh, it was going I think about 10 years. Harry Walker was the president uh, of it at that time and uh, it was quite it was much smaller than it is now. It was a one-week festival but it always has had a very high quality uh, of uh, adjudicators and what's the purpose of it? Is that where people come out and do their recitals at the students or is it... Are you uh, thinking of the music festival? Yeah. Well, the music festival is just really a get-together for students to play and hear each other play and an adjudicator will come and listen to them play and talk to them about their playing and then um, give them a... Say, and they used to give everybody a mark and now they don't do that. At least they don't read out the marks. They give first, second and third places. Um, and it's, it's not particularly competitive. It's, it's more of a learning, I think, a learning and listening experience. And now, uh, how did you get into the musical background? I mean, was your uh, mother or father or...? Both my parents were musical. My uh -huh. father played the mandolin very oh, well. He? Yes, he did. <laughs> and my mother was a he concert pianist. He wasn't Italian. <laughs> <laughs> no, he wasn't Italian. He was English. <laughs> um, and uh, my mother was a concert pianist and, oh, and played on the CBC regularly. They used to put her on before the CBC News. If there was, she was playing live. This is on the color. old radio. This right? is on the old radio broadcast. And my uh, sister-in-law said that she used to often hear Ann Walton play on the, on the news, but she, her big moment, I think, was when she played live on the radio in 1939 for the royal visit of uh, Queen Elizabeth and uh, King George VI. That was the first royal visit to Canada. It was a big deal. I have all the radio tapes, which I got last year from the CBC archives, five tapes of all the announcements, the whole radio broadcast, and my mother playing as filler in between when, when they were waiting for the cavalcade to come down the street, they would say, and now back to our studios for some music. and. Oh, and that would be thing. live music. That then, was live, it? and yeah. I have a I have a 14-page uh, letter that she wrote in pencil to her mother describing this whole day, and the thing that one of the things that amused me greatly was uh, that most of what she, they went to the garden party after too. They were invited to the garden party at government house, but most of what she wore was hand-me-downs. Somebody gave her a hat. Somebody else gave her a nice ribbon for it. And my father, who was in the silver fox business, was in the process of selling one of the silver fox capes. For, for somebody else, but my mother got to wear it that day before it was sold. 
<laughs> so this was all written in this letter, and uh, I, it quite intrigued me. And this was when the the, the queen, um, king and queen uh, came to Canada. Yes, 1939. It was. Yes, mm -hmm. that and was King George VI. That's so, right. Yeah. And the and what is now the Queen Mum, and everybody absolutely adored her, just like they did Diana later on. She was just idolized. And, yeah. Do you remember this, or how? No, I was three years old at the oh. time. Um, but I, as I say, I have this letter, and uh, I have photographs that my father took that day. And uh, it was always it was always something he talked about. What a big day it was in her life to play on the on this broadcast. And when I got the tapes last year, I was hoping that there would be more of her playing because I knew from the letter that she had played quite a bit. But of course, when they edited it for their archives, they took most of the music out. Oh, so I, I just see, have yeah. I just have sort of eight bars of this and four bars of this. But it's uh, uh, she died uh, in 1940 when I was three years old. So oh, I'm she really did. glad. Yes, of TB. So I'm really glad to have this little bit of little bit of her playing. Because I grew up, everybody always saying, "Oh, you sound like your mother." When I played, so was that because is that why you got involved in the music? Because yes, when, of this, or was <clears throat> no, my my brother and I were both musical when we were little, and our dad took us for piano lessons when I was seven and my brother was eight, and I can still remember him taking me by the hand and giving me to Miss Boyd, <laughs> Gladys Boyd, in Ottawa, and I was with her until I was 19 years old. I did my, I was her first student that did the uh, solo performer and the teacher's exams with her. So was this one of those? Uh, things where you ever had to, you had to you were dragged over to the no I never I never it, no like it? I loved it from the word go I never ever was told to practice ever I always liked to practice I never did homework but I always practiced because I remember uh, one uh, Yaisa Haifich was being interviewed one time and he said it was awful when he was older you know when he'd be 10 12 wanted to go out with, the, with mm -hmm, his other friends mm -hmm. and they would say no you have to practice so many hours well I think I wasn't in the but same caliber as Yaisa Haifich and I think uh, like I practiced my hour a day and everybody was happy yeah, <laughs> it wasn't sort of six hours. I can see why maybe he was he was upset. <laughs> and then you had to come home and do your uh, your lessons again. I guess I taught yeah. when I was in high school too. Yes, I, did. I didn't do much homework. I taught when I was in high school and I played for ballet classes. You taught uh, piano in your high school? Yes. Oh, I how long have you been teaching then? <laughs> I've been teaching for 48 years. I started when I was 14 years old. The kids next door. 48 years. Mm -hmm. And I got up every morning and did two hours of practice before I went to high school. And then, then my practice was done, and I could teach after school. This was your own for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And then you mm -hmm. taught after high school, uh, after school. Mm -hmm. Taught after school. Taught in the evenings. Is it? Is this, uh, how did you get involved in the teaching? Is this something you like to do? I like to do it. The people next door said, "Would you teach uh, our, our two little boys?" And I said, "Sure." <laughs> I had my grade nine uh, exam, piano exam, when I was in uh, still in grade eight public school, so. I, like I, I just launched in and taught, and I like it. I like kids, and I like teaching. I don't know. I, I, you have to have a certain temperament for that, because I, I, <laughs> being in music in myself at one time, and I know the, the friend where I was a piano a teacher, and it would be, I'd hear these students, and I said, oh my God. And then, no, try it again. Then, 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 <laughs> and oh, no, you oh, have then, to be and patient. Thought, oh, and I have to tell you, I had one little girl who didn't practice a lot, beautiful brown eyes, and she sat next to me on the bench, and she came for her lesson one day, and she's playing away, and it was, she hadn't practiced at all. And she turned these beautiful eyes at me and said, Mrs. Stanton, this must be just awful for you. <laughs> and I'd never had a child ever think how it was for me. <laughs> and I just looked at her and I said, it's not a lot of fun, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not only patient, but you have to enjoy it. You do, yeah. yeah. And you have to like kids, I think, too. And, and every child is different. I think you have to, to not push them beyond what they can do. On the other hand, you have to encourage them not to be lazy and to appreciate the fact that they're having lessons. And, and if they practice properly, not necessarily long, but pr properly, then in, in a week they'll really see some progress. And it's very good for kids' self-esteem. So if, if someone was looking now in or one of our viewers or has had a, a daughter or a son or a granddaughter, how would they know that they should, uh, they, is there something that that children express that makes them want, or is it the parents say, I want you to play, um, you know? I think often the kids are at the piano or they're listening to music, they're obviously interested in music, maybe they sing, if they come from a home where the parents have sung to them, where music is important in the home. I think it's sort of a natural evolution and I think quite often, I think the child says, I wish I could play the piano or could I have piano lessons. And, and I think sometimes too the parents think this child is musical and I'd like them to learn to play. To me it's a, a form of literacy to, to be able to play music. Um, and uh, I, I think it's nice that children are offered lessons. I, I don't like to see them have to stay with it when they realize that they don't want to spend the time or it's not really what they want to do as they get older. I think they should be able to allowed to stop lessons with the feeling that they haven't failed, that yeah. you know, they've learned this. And, and quite often I found that kids that maybe only went to grades three or four or five, later on I see them playing in the high school band or singing in the operetta or whatever and I think that, you know, that, that was worthwhile. 
Because I, I, and we had a piano in our our home, you know, the old opera. Mm -hmm. Again, mm -hmm. my mother, my sister wanted, to, or my mother, I don't know where it was, where it came from, but my sister was the one that took the lessons, and mm -hmm. so we had to have a piano. We managed right. to get this piano, and one day, uh, I can't remember when it was, but we were listening to, this, we heard this boogie woogie, boom, 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 you know, mm -hmm. and it was my older brother came in, and he just sort of picked it up. Right, played by ear. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and he would play the boogie woogie, which I kind of liked. I thought, oh, oh it was, it's neat. It, it, was, yeah. it was better than these <laughs> lessons. That, <laughs> Sound better than the scales and chords eh? yeah, that my sister was doing going through. Yeah, but there's a mm -hmm. lot of discipline there. Isn't there is there? a lot of discipline there. Yes, there is. There's the, there's the fun part of performing, but every piece you learn, you're starting from scratch. You don't know it, and it never gets easier. Like every piece is hard, and then it gets easier, and then you can play it. And, and I think this is a good thing for kids to learn. It's, it's not an instant thing, but they feel really good when they can get up and play this. Um, I, I know the, uh, a lot of people re remark about that movie that came out a number of years ago, you know, Mr. Holland's uh, Opus. Opus. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> in fact, well, in this case, it was a uh, music teacher who taught in the high school. Mm -hmm. But still, it, it's that same feeling, isn't there? You, later on, you think, you think back, these people mm -hmm. think back to the, my years, even though I didn't go on and become a, me a, a pianist That's or right. a That's professional right. musician. Yeah, I think, it feel, I think music feels a real need in people's life. Um, um, I know it does for me. It's a, um, an emotional thing. Uh, I, when, I'm, when I'm not playing, I don't feel like myself. I feel I express myself through my music. And physically, I think people that don't play don't realize how, how good it feels physically, the tactile part of playing the piano or playing another instrument, sure. Uh, I'm sure, too. Um, I think the cello would be just great because you get to hug oh, it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, <that's right. laughs> or a violin that you can feel the vibrations. But, it, but, it, but physically, it's, it's a really nice thing to do. I used to play the bass, the stand-up bass. Did you? And, oh, yeah. And you could lean into that. I could never reach really the bass. Really hug that. I, I could. <laughs> well, do you still practice every day? Is, is I do. Does the teacher I do. have to no, practice? I get up in the morning, and I do, my, I do some technical exercises. Yes, I do. I, if, I want to, if you want to play, you have to practice them. Uh, I like to learn new things. I'm, I'm memorizing. I, I like to, as I find now, I, I keep memorizing something to check, test my memory. It's good for your mind, I think, to, to memorize. So, okay. so just the, the, the teacher uh, himself or herself, mm -hmm. can, they, they have And to also, continue. if you're going to teach, you, you need to be able to play the pieces to demonstrate for your students. Um, I find a lot of them don't get to hear a lot of live music, or, or even they're, they're at school when the FM radio is on, they don't get to hear. If you're learning a Mozart piece, it really is helpful if you've heard some Mozart played by other people. Like, you, you understand about styles of music, I yeah. think, from listening to, to it. it. You just sort of absorb it if you grow up with, with some Bach and Baroque music and, uh, or Romantic music. Miss Boyd it took my brother and I to every pianist that came to, to Ottawa. Oh, she did? Mm -hmm. From the time we were 12 or 13, it was a Witold Malkazinski, a Russian, a Polish pianist that came and played Chopin, well, which really inspired my brother and I to play Chopin. Well, on that note, we're going to take a short break. Don't go away. We'll be right back with Mary Lou Stanton. Did you know that Newmarket was home of a Canadian Army basic training camp during the Second World War? In the summer of 1940, the mayor, Reeve, and Deputy Reeve set off for Ottawa to offer the government free use of the town's fairground as a site for an Army basic training camp. They were successful, and the camp was completed in less than six weeks. The camp consisted of 36 buildings, which included a large drill hall, barracks, cookhouse, guard rooms, and two canteens. In October, the first of 900 recruits arrived to start their basic training. The camp meant a prosperous war for many of Newmarket's merchants, and by the end of the war in 1945, thousands of Canada's young men had been trained at Newmarket's basic training centre. Many of these men boarded trains at the Newmarket station to head directly overseas. And that's the way it was in our region. All right, when we broke for that, uh that message there, where we're talking about yourself and your brother and, he, and your piano teacher, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Boyd, took you to all these concerts. This is this is yourself and your uh, your it brother. Is. We played in the music festival, and uh, I can remember being quite embarrassed that day because the adjudicator said, "When you play a piano duet, it's four hands, but it's just one mind." And he looked at the <laughs> at the photographer, said, "Yes, and the mind is my sister's." Because <laughs> <laughs> I practiced all the time. He didn't. He played really well, but he didn't practice very much. And I was always reminding him as he played, "Don't forget this. Don't forget that." Here comes the. <laughs> what is this? We were looking at this, I was looking at this picture here, this uh, old farmhouse mm -hmm. here. This is my grandparents' farm at Sparrow Lake, and they took my brother and I from the time we were four and five years old, every summer uh, until we were teenagers and started to work, um, because our mother had died and our father was working in, in Ottawa for the government, and uh, 
Um, the grandparents took us and it was just idyllic. We had Clydesdale horses and cows and chickens and Silver Fox Farm and a river to swim in and a rowboat and bows and arrows and stilts to walk on, hayloft to jump in, uh, all farm fresh foods and it was just a wonderful place. So this was in uh, Sparrow Lakes near up near Gravenhurst? Just north of Aurelia, yeah. south, south of Gravenhurst. And yeah, north of in between mm -hmm. uh, Aurelia and Gravenhurst mm -hmm. there. Um, on the left-hand side, I think you could. That's the, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. South Sparrow Lake Road. So, and, and this was a was a working farm, was it? It was. My grandfather was a farmer, and he was a, a boat builder and a lumberman. And in the fall, he would go into the, he would lease land and go into the bush with the uh, Clydesdale horses and cut the the trees, like select trees, and then the, the horses would haul them out on the ice and then into the, down to the water. And then in the summer, we, he would uh, get uh, one of the Stanton boats, actually, and tow his logs to the mill down in Washago. Was this where you met your husband? It was. Uh, I spent my, my summers with my grandmother, and my grandmother and my husband's father, uh, George Stanton, who ran Stanton House Hotel, were first cousins. So I always called Jim's parents Uncle George and Aunt Eva when I was his a child. <laughs> yes, because that's what they did with, with sort of close families. And then when my grandmother took me over the summer, I was 16, she said, now you call them Mr. and Mrs. Stanton, just like all the other waitresses. And my husband was the dishwasher, and I thought he was the nicest man I'd ever seen, and never changed my mind. That was when you were 16? Mm-hmm. So mm -hmm. you, uh, the Stan that Stanton house is the uh, the lodge up there right. in, in mm -hmm. the uh, Muskokas. That's right. Oh, so that's... Uh, in Port Stanton. In Port Stanton. <laughs> they didn't even... <laughs> Well, that goes back a long time, It too. does, and, and uh, Jim's grandfather was the uh, first uh, steamboat captain on the lake. Um, the railway didn't come in until 1906, and that was a big event. It now runs right beside behind our cottage, and we rather wish it didn't, but it does. But when I went up there to work, the passengers got off the train and, and went to the hotels from, from the train. Oh, that's right. And all the freight don't... used to, the, the, the supplies for the hotels would come. And people would stay there um, not just a week or so. No, they used of... to stay two weeks and a month, yeah, and some sometimes. people came for the summers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you would leave Ottawa every summer. Yes, my father would take us out of school a few days early because he always had to take us camping. We always went through Algonquin Park and camped a little bit. I can always remember being thrilled as a child to get out. <laughs> Didn't have to wait for my report card. Got taken back up to camping because we went camping every year, canoe camping with him. And uh, then we get taken to the grandparents. And I can remember opening the car doors and just running for the strawberry patch because it was always the end of June. And it was just it was just heaven to us that farm we, so we you'd be there it. until what the fall i guess mm -hmm. right? yeah my grandmother and grandfather used to weigh us in and weigh us out down at the silver fox place where we mixed up the food they, they had big scales to weigh the, the fox food and uh, they'd stand us on this and, and my brother was quite a thin little boy and grandma's goal was to put some fat on kingsley <laughs> oh, oh the, your, your <laughs> so brother. she'd write to my father at the end of the summer and say kingsley weighed so much when he came and now he weighs this much more <laughs> and and uh, I, I guess because um, we we spent summers up uh, that way as well mm -hmm. uh, some sometimes and you'd go for the whole summer and you're really tough trying to get back into the mm -hmm. into the city life again. Mm -hmm. Did you live right downtown in Ottawa? Um, in Ottawa South, yes, it was near near Lansdowne Park, and uh, Ottawa was only about fifty thousand people when I lived there. So two months of of this, mm -hmm. and then having to go back to the to the smoke in the downtown. It wasn't really very smoky in Ottawa. Ottawa was very, it was very no, it small town at that point. <laughs> and I was always glad to see my father. And when, when uh, I was seven and my brother was eight, our dad remarried and we got a, a mother again, which we were absolutely thrilled with. It was uh, uh, Ethel and we knew her and loved her. And uh, it was it was really... So a second mother. A second mother, a second mother, a second chance to have a mother. Because I really, you know, as a little child, as you know, you miss having a mother. Um, and then uh, when I was 14 and my brother was 15, they had a baby boy. Bruce. Oh. So I now have a, uh, another brother in, in Ottawa. A half brother. A half brother in Ottawa. Yes. So when when you uh, when did you get married? When did you meet? You met. 19, you? I met him in 1953 or four, and married. We married in 1956. So he never had a chance. Did he, he never had a chance. That's <laughs> no. what I've always told him. <laughs> he liked me too, but yeah, yeah. I think I did pick him. Yeah. <laughs> I liked his whole family. There was a, a real gentleness and niceness about that family that I like. And you said you went to Stratford in uh, the, the late 50s after you were married, where yes. you, you taught for a while. Were you there when the Stratford Festival was starting? It was just the end of the tent era. I was never in the tent, and uh, the beginning of the, uh, the, the, the festival building was being built that year. But it was wonderful because we lived when we lived on Douglas Street, uh, Bruno Jerusi lived two doors up, Francis Highland lived further up, Siobhan McKenna lived down on the corner, and uh, be just before we came there, they used to see Alec Guinness all the time. Uh, riding around on his bicycle. Uh, it, it was wonderful. We sublet our, our apartment uh, every summer to a mu one of the musicians in the orchestra because I had a grand piano and they liked that. 
And they also liked the fact they could have their cat there. <laughs> oh, so did you get tickets for this from time to time? Well, the, uh, yes, we did. When we were there, we saw every play that was ever put on because you could get preview tickets for $2. And when we left after six years, I said to Jim, surely we'll go back every year to see the plays. And we did for a little bit, but we sort of got away from it. We, we still go, but we don't see everything like we used to. So what brought you to Newmarket in 1962? Um, mainly we felt, we, we loved Stratford, and it was a beautiful place to live, but his, uh, my home was in Ottawa, and our, we, at this point we had a cottage at Sparrow Lake. And you were still going up every summer, I guess. We were, weekend. every summer, and, and quite a few weekends, but it was three and a half hours to the cottage from, from Stratford. That was the main reason we moved, really. And, and he, so, ta he taught uh, history here, mm -hmm. didn't he, at Newmarket mm -hmm. High? Yes, he did. A lot of the, the and uh, and to, to come, when we decided we wanted to move, we got the map of Ontario, and in those days, uh, uh, teachers were so sought after, there were, there were not enough to go around, and uh, we said, where would we like to live? And we picked Newmarket. And you had Close to Toronto. No, never been here. No, close to Toronto, an hour and a half from Sparrow Lake and not so far from Ottawa. But that'd be a small town at that time, It was. It, it was, uh, I think, 3,500 people. In Crossland's North? farm like, up at the end of the street here it had sheep and cows on it. I used to be able to step out of my door on Millard Avenue and smell the cows, which I loved being a summer farm girl. So how do you how do you get into uh, uh, I mean how do you get students? Do you just hang a shingle out or just? I've never done that, and I've never advertised in the paper. Basically, word of mouth, word of mouth. When I first came, I didn't care how many pupils I had. I had young children and, and uh, different, usually from other teachers. Other teachers will phone and say, I had a phone call, I can't take this student, would you be interested? Um, and as I say, going to the music teachers' meetings with uh, May Patterson, people got to know you and, and through the festival. It's sort of a gradual thing. So what's a typical day like for, for a piano teacher? You're up in the morning, you're doing I'm up doing at 6.30, your, mm -hmm. doing get your up two and hours. do my stretches, get up and do my stretches. Oh, oh yes. I, I lie down on the floor and stretch, yeah, and do some exercises. Uh, Jim goes for the paper, and then I usually do my hand and exercises and technique to spare him having to listen to that every day. <laughs> uh, then I have breakfast, and I usually teach two lessons from uh, 8 o'clock till about 9 or 9.15. Then I'll practice well, Because myself. these would be students mm -hmm. that would go, some, have to Some go students to... like the morning time, and yeah. I do too. So they'd have to go to school, of course. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, and then uh, I, uh, I usually practice then for about an hour and uh, do some of the arts, visual, visual and performing arts, new market phoning and work with that. Um, like to swim after lunch if it's uh, skiing like it was last week. We go skiing out in the York County Forest for an hour in the afternoon. And um, then I teach again from about three till six. Jim cooks a delicious supper while oh. I'm down there. <laughs> <laughs> from three to six, so these would be these the are sort students of right, yeah. coming after school now. That's right, they're, they're and, and uh, I teach Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and I'm never going to retire, so I don't teach Friday, and I don't teach weekends, and I don't teach nights. In other words, I'm teaching who I want, when I want, and I'm happy with this, so I don't feel overloaded. So how many students would you have? I have about 26 now. 26? Yeah. And do they all come at different times? They, they do. Do they come mm -hmm. every week? Or mm -hmm. they, most, yes, they come every week. And then I don't teach all summer, um, although occasionally if a student is doing a summer exam in August, I'll come when I'm down to cut the grass and this type of thing, we'll have a lesson. But uh, What's the, with the youngest them. person you, you, you've, you've taught? My youngest, I teach my twin granddaughters, and my youngest than them even is a little girl called Haley Alcock, who just turned six, will turn six at the end of February, and lives around the corner and walks over to her lesson by herself, and uh, she's a real fun child to teach. She's, she's well, musical and interested. And if you were talking to parents and they said they wanted to get their child into uh, piano lessons or some type mm -hmm. of musical lesson, it could be guitar or wind mm -hmm. instrument or something, what would you, how young should they start? Well, they used to think, I used to always tell people, wait till they're about seven. They pick it up so easily. It's a very positive experience for them. They, they learn to read music very quickly at seven or eight. Now all the research shows that um, music is very, very good for a young child's brain. It joins the synapses. Um, in the brain, and they say four, four and five is when they should start. And I taught both my own children when they were four because they were there, and yeah. they both played well hands together. And, and by the time they were six, but they don't have the, the hand uh, uh, size in that at that age. They, they don't, but you're, it's a, it, well, it varies from child to child. Some children do have a, just a natural way of holding their hands, and uh, my grandchildren do, and little Haley does too. They're, they're nice spread between the fingers, and they they just play away. It's an, a very natural thing for some children. It's not for every child at four or five. It would be um, it would be off-putting for some of them. They have to sort of be musical and want to do it. I think, or, and also have a parent at home who will help them a little bit. Yeah. Now, and, and 48 years, I mean, you've, you've seen everything. I've how seen you, them, I've How seen did you lot. make it through the, 
the 60s. I with love everybody, the 60s. Everybody wanted I to, loved all the folk why would, why, why would want to learn Mozart in the 60s? You know? <laughs> Listen, I like to teach all my children how to play 12-bar blues. I've, I've never, if a child comes to me and says, I want to play the Titanic song, I never say no. Um, uh, they all uh, do some micro-jazz uh, work. Um, I can remember Miss Boyd once said to me once, <laughs> when I had a lesson, Mary Lou, I'm so happy because you never bring me any of that popular stuff. And I loved the popular stuff, but I never let her hear me playing it. And we had a friend that would come and play, a friend of my father's that played uh, St. Louis Blues, which I just loved. And I thought, oh, to be able to play St. Louis Blues would just be great. <laughs> and you did. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We have yes, a, a few minutes left, and I know we could talk for hours about this, but uh, you're involved with the uh, Visual Arts, uh, Visual and Performing Arts, Arts mm -hmm. Newmarket Market mm -hmm. and you have a series of uh, concerts, concerts going on. We, we've just seen, uh, what was the first one back in November? Uh, we had Anton Querdy and Christine Baggio, his wife, right. piano and cello, and uh, on, in February, it's uh, Musica Viva Chamber Trio, and then March 28th is so, Maureen Forrester and David Warwick. Oh, she's, she'll be here? She will be here in March, yes, the end of March. And next year we have a very uh, exciting series planned. And if there's anybody out there who would like to work with people that are promoting concerts, please give me a call. We're looking for people, particularly oh. people that want to work on publicity. And, oh, what's uh, your phone number then? 895-6782. And, and is that the same number they can phone for information about VPAN as well yes, for tickets? Yes, that's right. For, well, no, they should phone me at Newmarket Theatre for tickets. But uh, if they would, if anybody would like to be on our mailing list and be, get our brochure about these concerts, phone phone me and I will make sure you're on the. Oh, well, that's list. quite a scoop, having Maureen Forrester and. Uh, it is. It is. And, and the mm -hmm. pianist here, and well, she's she's doing some of these sort of modern things now, isn't she's she? She's doing uh, half yeah. the program is classics, but the other half is called Interpretations of a Life, which David Warwick, her pianist, wrote for her, oh. and it's it's her singing some songs about her life, and uh, the one I like particularly, and Judy Craig, who's on the committee, does too, is the uh, shopaholic. When she goes okay. to a new town, she well, I have to cut you off because we're right. out of time, but thanks for coming. <laughs> Thank back you for having you. me, John. It was and a pleasure. And until next time, I'm John Dallison for Profiles. God, goodbye for now.